Hello friends, my name is JJ. So here is a fun fact. In the seven or so years I have been making educational videos on YouTube, I have never consulted Wikipedia when doing my research. Not even once. In fact, well over a decade ago, long before I even started doing YouTube, I actually installed a website blocking app on my browser so I couldn't visit the site even if I wanted to. I also used Google's hide search result feature to ensure it wouldn't pop up when I was searching for things. I just disliked the website so much I didn't even want to be tempted by it. But it turns out my efforts were in vain because these days Wikipedia is literally impossible to avoid Avoid. Even if you have Wikipedia blocked from your search results, Google still creates these little inescapable information boxes full of Wikipedia info whenever you search for something. If you ask Alexa or Siri a question, the answer will always come from Wikipedia. And Wikipedia information will automatically pop up the moment you try to type something into the Safari search bar or Apple Spotlight. The site's integration with all of the major tech platforms is more than mutual. Google, Amazon, and Apple have all become major funders of Wikipedia in recent years, keeping the non-profit site up and running with millions of dollars in donations. Small wonder then that by some estimates it is the fifth most visited site in the world and the number one most visited information site with over six billion monthly visits. So what does it mean when so much of the world's information on everything comes from a single website? Well the obvious answer is that there becomes very little diversity of information available to the public. In the realm of non-fiction content in particular, it can now just be taken for granted that an enormous number of articles, podcasts, and videos will simply be thinly veiled regurgitations of Wikipedia pages. And it's not just that these copycats repeat the same information, it's that they organize the same information in the same way, cite the same sources, offer the same analysis, use the same narratives, and reach the same conclusions. Let me give you a tangible example. A while ago, I was making a video on American monsters, and I wanted to do some research on Dracula. And I like to listen to podcasts as part of my research process, since they often feature experts talking about a subject that they are passionate about. And as I was listening to this one podcast, where these two guys were discussing the history of the original 1931 Dracula movie, I started to get a bit suspicious. They were rattling off all of these very precise details about the movie's production and anecdotes involving the relationships between the different actors and details about the budget and stuff about what the writers and directors thought about this or that and quotes from film critics. And frankly, the hosts of this particular podcast struck me as far too dopey to have found all of these highly specific factoids on their own. And so I unblocked Wikipedia and loaded up the Dracula movie page and sure enough, every single fact the podcast guys had shared was lifted from the Wikipedia page, presented in the exact same order. The stories, the anecdotes, the quotes, they had said nothing that hadn't also appeared here. What was presented to me as a couple of amateur experts sharing the history of an important film was really just little more than a couple of guys who clearly knew nothing about anything, offering a broad paraphrase of a single website summary with absolutely nothing new or original added. And this is what consuming information on the internet has become. Even if you strenuously seek to avoid using Wikipedia, you can't escape it because so many people have absolutely no shame about just brazenly regurgitating information from the site. All of those blogs sharing obscure facts about crazy places or YouTube channels telling you wacky stories from forgotten history, you know, they might seem like they're the product of a creative individual's independent research, but if you cross-reference their subject with the corresponding Wikipedia page, the odds are high that you'll find that they too are sharing nothing beyond what Wikipedia has. At best, a staggeringly high percentage of information on the internet these days, even including news reports and the mainstream media, merely consist of well-curated selections of Wikipedia content. Now, this matters for a few reasons. One is that we should be deeply concerned about knowledge being monopolized in such a dramatic and unprecedented way. Here's a good quote from the historian Matthew White, who once ran a very good anti-Wikipedia blog. Wikipedia has become the McDonald's slash Microsoft slash Walmart of information. It provides reliably mediocre information at a low, low cost. This 
drives competitors out of business, reduces diversity, and lowers the standards all across the board. Just as McDonald's is where you go when you're hungry, but don't really care about the quality of your food, Wikipedia is where you go when you're curious, but don't really care about the quality of your knowledge. When I was young, the internet was filled with multiple different websites on multiple different topics. If you wanted to learn about, say, the history of pizza, you would have to hunt around until you found a special pizza-centric website that someone had made. Often these websites were true passion projects containing enormous amounts of information by dedicated experts, sometimes professionals, sometimes not, but always presented in a way that reflected a deep and legitimate interest in the subject. I think of websites like Robert Criscow's Amazingly Thorough Guide to American Rock Music, or Mark Shoemaker's site about Japanese spirituality and folklore, or B. Schemmel's Encyclopedia of World Leaders, or Old Man Matthew White's Historical Atlas of the 20th Century. There used to be a lot of these kind of sites back in the day, but they have slowly faded away over time, and there seems to be little interest in making them anymore, given your average internet user will see no reason to ever visit such a site, since Wikipedia is right there. The fact that so many of the old single topic sites offered a higher quality of knowledge was ultimately no match for the one-stop shop convenience of Wiki. The fall of the single topic information sites was also significant in that it marked a significant decline in authorial accountability for the information we consume online. So in theory, anyone who wants to can edit a Wikipedia article, and Wikipedia lists as one of its core principles the idea that people should be able to contribute to articles without providing a real name or even registering for an account. This is worrying unto itself, but in any case, in practice, the writing and editing of Wikipedia articles is done by an extremely tiny subculture of largely anonymous, hardcore Wikipedia nerds. People have used different ways to measure just how small the clique of people who make and revise Wikipedia articles is, and the conclusion seems to be that it's about 1% of all registered users, and that this number has been declining in recent years. This Vice story from 2017 estimated that only about 1,300 people are creating the over three quarters of the 600 new articles posted to Wikipedia every day. While this 2019 CBS story estimated that a third of everything on Wikipedia was written by just one guy. Even generally sympathetic scholars of Wikipedia, like Purdue University's Soren Anamate, will readily concede that the site is run by a pretty narrow elite, saying that Wikipedia only works because it has a dedicated leadership class and that people worried about its biases should care less about broadening the site's base of users than trying to diversify the people at the top. And who are the people at the top? Well, the conclusion of those who have crunched some of the publicly available data, which Wikipedia tries to keep to a minimum, seems to be that it is mostly people who resemble this guy. A few middle-aged white male Americans with a lot of free time on their hands, but no real credentials for creating the world's leading repository of knowledge beyond that. This lack of diversity might not come as a great shock, considering that other researchers have found that the Wikipedia elite have been generally quite good at erecting complicated bureaucratic rules around themselves to consolidate their power, intimidate newbies, and just generally make the site's content quite difficult for outsiders to change. Anyone who has tried to edit a Wikipedia page will know that the experience is often something akin to going to the grocery store and trying to rearrange the shelves. No matter how well-meaning and logical your changes are, they will not be appreciated and in all likelihood quickly undone the moment you leave. A 2013 study by several American academics was so discouraged by the cliquish, defensive, and unaccountable culture of the Wikipedia elite which they called a case of socio-technical gatekeeping, that they offered this snippy conclusion. Wikipedia has changed from the encyclopedia that anyone can edit to the encyclopedia that anyone who understands the norms, socializes him or herself, dodges the impersonal wall of semi-automated rejection, and still wants to voluntarily contribute his or her time, can edit. Now I'm not somebody who thinks that Wikipedia is full of lies or anything that dramatic, although the General factual accuracy of the articles does tend to vary quite a bit based on how much the editorial clique cares about a given topic. When I was working on my video about American toys, for instance, the 
wiki-generated fact box about Charles Darrow that popped up in every Google search, described him as the man who stole Lizzie McGee's landlord game and was falsely credited by the Parker brothers as the inventor of Monopoly, all of which is an incredibly biased framing of a much more complex situation. But Charles Darrow is also a very obscure historical figure whose story I doubt anybody will care enough to properly tell on his short bio page. But this is the important point. First impressions matter. A Wikipedia article is simply one take on a given topic, but these days it is often the first and only take anyone will hear. The site's smothering dominance of the internet's information ecosystem, including through its complete integration with Google and Apple products, means that how Wikipedia chooses to frame a subject cannot help but become the first and last frame that an enormous number of people will ever encounter of that subject. Now, I know that one of the things people like to say about Wikipedia is, oh, I only go there as a starting point. This has always struck me as being about as persuasive as people in the old days claiming to only read Playboy for the articles. Because I mean, if Wikipedia competitors are largely non-existent, then it is hardly obvious where all of these people are going after Wikipedia to flesh out or corroborate what they learned. You may recall that I called Wikipedia the world's number one information website. Well, what's the second? Similar Web, a web analytics company, lets you sort the internet's most popular sites by category. And when it comes to the genre of reference materials, dictionaries, and encyclopedias, you have to scroll through a lot of definition sites and translation apps before you find another comprehensive encyclopedia type website. Britannica.com is pretty much the only other site on the net that even approximates Wikipedia's ambition. And it's not even in the world's top 1,000 sites. People will then say that they follow the sources from a Wikipedia article, but independent of the fact that this still means that you're relying on Wikipedia for your information, it has always struck me as another deeply disingenuous claim. Wikipedia's sources, after all, in the sense of the footnotes that they pepper their articles with, don't exist to offer readers a more comprehensive understanding of the topic at hand. They exist simply as a collection of proof points for various arguments made in the article's body text. So they're often just links to news stories or documents that contained a fact or two that was relevant for the purpose of citing something narrowly particular of little interest to a more general reader. Because again, most of the time, educational websites containing general information of a sort that would be of interest to a general reader don't even exist on the internet outside of Wikipedia at all. Now, let me just dunk on Wikipedia's quality of writing for a second. Wikipedia articles are written in a style that they call neutral point of view, which although perhaps attractive sounding in theory, is in practice just another intimidating bureaucratic gatekeepery custom that is quite difficult for outsiders to intuitively grasp. Neutral point of view basically just means that Wikipedia articles should prioritize the citation of facts over coherence or readability. It doesn't mean that Wikipedia articles cannot be biased, which they very easily can, but rather that any information you communicate to the reader should be delivered as awkwardly and robotically as possible. Since no priority is given to clarity, relevance, readability, or any other helpful quality of communicating knowledge, Wikipedia articles tend to be long and bloated rambles where editors have crammed in whatever random factoids happen to interest them for one reason or another. This bloat is then easily mistaken for comprehensiveness, which helps contribute to the idea that a Wikipedia article contains everything that can be possibly said on a topic, and thus there is no reason to bother trying to compete with it. But anyway, let me give you a couple examples of why Wikipedia writing is some of the least helpful educational writing you will ever encounter. Here's a paragraph from their 8,000 word article on Mario. Super Mario Sunshine was the first Nintendo with Zitaru Iwata as the CEO of Nintendo who succeeded Hiroshi Yamauchi. The game's original concept did not feature Mario, as the developers believed the role was too out of the ordinary for such a character. Later on, when they used a generic man for the role instead, they believed having a realistic person alongside a character like Mario would cause incongruity, and was ultimately changed to Mario instead. Mario's ally, FLUDD, was one of ten design options but was chosen because it fit the game's theme, although it was not their favorite option in looks. 
As a reader, why am I being told this bizarre ramble of trivia and anecdotes? What is Super Mario Sunshine? Why does it matter? Why should someone interested in learning about Mario care about any of this? So much of the most relevant knowledge is simply assumed while the most irrelevant knowledge is prioritized. All right, now here is a paragraph from their 11,000 word article on Stephen Harper. During Harper's tenure, Canada had budgetary surpluses in 2006 and 2007 of $13.8 and $9.6 billion respectively. Following the 2008 financial crisis, Canada ran deficits from 2008 to 2013. The deficit was $55.6 billion in 2009 and was gradually lowered to $5.2 billion in 2013. In 2014, the federal budget was balanced with a surplus of $1.9 billion. For the first 11 months of the 2015-2016 period, the federal government was on track for a $7.5 billion surplus. For 2015-2016, the federal government projected a $1.4 billion surplus. Following the 2015 federal election and a change in government, the 2015 fiscal year ended in a $1 billion deficit instead. In 2010, Canada had the lowest debt-to-GDP ratio in the G7 economies. The Economist magazine stated that Canada had come out of the recession stronger than any other rich country in the G7. In 2013, Canada came out with global market tax plan to generate employment opportunities for Canadians. Congratulations if you could make sense of that. Again, why is it essential for me to know so many specific numbers to understand who Stephen Harper is and why he matters. Imagine how much more efficient it would have been to just say, though Stephen Harper's nine years in office saw a mixture of budget deficits and surpluses, he was generally praised for his management of Canada's finances, particularly during the Great Recession. And here is a paragraph from Wikipedia's 11,000 word article on Vancouver. The Vancouver School of Conceptual Photography, often referred to as Vogo Conceptualism, is a term applied to a grouping of artists from Vancouver who achieved international recognition starting in the 1980s. No formal school exists and the grouping remains both informal and often controversial even among the artists themselves, who often resist the term. Artists associated with the term include Jeff Wall, Ian Wallace, Ken Lum, Roy Arden, Stan Douglas and Rodney Graham. This is a classically muddled Wikipedia paragraph that is obviously trying to mediate some sort of feud between editors who cannot agree if Vancouver conceptual photography is a thing or not. We are told of the controversy, and given the names of photographers who may or may not be part of a school that may or may not exist, but we are never told what Vancouver conceptual photography actually is, or why anyone should care about it. So, at the beginning of this video, I bragged about how I don't use Wikipedia, and I'd like to conclude this video by recommending some of the better online resources that I use instead. First and foremost, I do recommend books. There is simply no better alternative than a full-length, well-researched, non-fiction book put out by a credible publisher. A good non-fiction book is often the result of years of dedicated research by someone who is passionate and well-informed about the topic, with their writing subject to top-tier levels of professional editing to ensure clarity and readability. And you might notice I said online resources, and that's no accident. These days, through sites like Amazon or Apple Books, you can easily purchase digital versions of books from different eras that in earlier eras you would only be able to get at the bookstore or Maybe not even that, if the book was particularly obscure. And if you don't want to spend money, it is also worth exploring the website of your local library, many of which have extensive ebook programs these days, where you can download a huge number of books to read on your computer or mobile device for free. Books can take a long time to read, however, so one thing that I have found an effective shortcut is to just listen to interviews by nonfiction authors. When an author publishes a book, they will usually go on an extended book tour and give many interviews to the main mainstream media, as well as things like podcasts. And if the interview is long enough, they will often just wind up summarizing their entire book, or at least its most important points, making this a very efficient educational resource as well. Two particularly great sources as far as this goes would be C-SPAN's book notes or Q&A interview series, or the New Books podcast, which feature long, serious interviews with a ton of non-fiction authors describing books that they've written on an enormous range of subjects. Mainstream media sources are important as well, but not just one-off, isolated news articles of the sort that Wikipedia likes to quote. Established publications with ample reporting resources, like the New York Times or the Washington Post, where I work, or the New Yorker or the Atlantic, 
will often author very good deep dives into a single topic that are basically the equivalent of entire chapters in a nonfiction book. When it comes to biographies of individuals, meanwhile, I really recommend reading their obituaries in publications like these as well. A long obituary essay in a paper like the New York Times is often the culmination of all of the reporting that they have ever done on that person, and I think they remain among the best biographical resources that you can find on the internet today, at least for dead people. I would certainly put the New York Times obituary of Gorbachev up against the Wikipedia page on him any day. And lastly, I would recommend other comprehensive nonfiction websites, to the extent they are still around, in addition to sites like Encyclopedia Britannica or Biography.com or History.com. There do exist more specialized educational websites out there, often handmade by a single person or a small team who is dedicated to sharing their high-level, in-depth knowledge of a given subject with the world. You do have have to hunt around a bit to find these sorts of sites these days, and obviously you should always make a personal assessment of how credible the author is. But at the very least, these sites tend to invite that sort of scrutiny by having the author state clearly who they are and what their background is, which is a vast improvement over Wikipedia's anonymous and unaccountable writer model. If we care about competition, I think it is very important that we support these sites just as we should support small businesses in our community rather than just shop at the big box store. My great passion in life is, of course, social studies and civics, so I am not as much of an authority when it comes to good online resources for science or math or subjects like that. Let me know in the comments if you have any recommendations for good websites as far as that sort of stuff goes. Now, when I was a kid, we were sold a promise of the internet as a place that was infinitely rich with information, with a million web pages pages on every topic, stretching out endlessly in all directions. These days, however, it really does feel like the internet has just sort of congealed into a few giant all-purpose sites. You know, one for shopping, three for socializing, and one for information. And I think it's important that we be critical of monopolistic consolidation on the internet in the same way we should be critical of monopolistic control elsewhere. Not because the people who run monopolies are necessarily evil, but because monopolies often only get where they are by pandering to our shallow desires for what is quick and easy and good enough above what is truly good, useful, or necessary. So. Very curious to hear your reactions to all of this. I'm sure my takes will be controversial, but let me know in the comments and I will see you next week.